Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to another edition of the Sports Exchange, our first sports exchange of the 2020 year. And glad to have uh, Mel Farr Jr. on the broadcast. Welcome back, Mel. Hey, how's it going, guys? Happy 2021. Happy 2021. Rick Curdy, I know you were aching to see 2020 go, and, well, it did. Yeah, I'm looking forward to 2021. Tough ending for me at the uh on the back end over Thanksgiving with my mom passing away, but I know she's looking down on us and said, you know what you got to do. Quit thinking about me all the time. Well, you know, never quit thinking about you, but we know what we got to do. And tonight here on the Sports Exchange, we're going to be talking a lot of football. We're going to talk about a couple of key headlines today, and then we're going to talk about last week's wild card round as well as this coming week's divisional round. So with that said, breaking news, Urban Meyer, uh, has now agreed to a deal to coach the Jacksonville Jaguars. Urban walks into a situation where they have about $77 million of cap space, seven picks in the first four rounds. And, of course, it doesn't hurt when Trevor Lawrence is an old thing either. And a fan base that's hungry where you do anything, you have any kind of success there, he'll have a statue out, outside of that Jaguar that's sitting in front of TIA, TIA Bank Field. So, Mel, what are your thoughts about Urban Meyer? going to Jacksonville? Um, you know, he's won everywhere that he's been. You know, Bowling Green, Utah, Florida, Ohio State. Uh, I think that he's going to do, I think he wants to try to take, his, take it to the next level, see what he can do. I think everybody wants to challenge himself and take it to the highest level and see how they can, how well they can do. And uh, I look for him to do, uh, I think Urban Meyer is a, is a great leader of men. And I think he'll do a, a great job there in Jacksonville. I mean, he's, like I said, he's been successful everywhere he's been. So I have no reason to believe that he won't be successful there. Doesn't hurt, like you said, that he does have the number one pick and Trevor Lawrence coming. So he'll have the answer to the quarterback position. And, you know, in order to compete at any level, you have to have somebody competent at that position. And he, and he definitely, definitely will. And then again, and they'll also be able to go out in the free agent market with all that cap space and be able to attract some players, be able to get some players in. And Jacksonville is not a difficult place to attract free agents because you have no state tax there. Right. So that's a that's a bonus. The weather is great there. There's another bonus. It's not a big market like, you know, maybe a Miami or it's not like a New York or maybe even a, even a Dallas. But it is a, a nice place to live. Great weather, no state tax. And you got a, a proven winner as a coach. So I, I believe he'll be able to attract a lot of people there and look forward to, you know, I look forward to Jacksonville being very competitive very, very soon. Yeah, as media guys won't beat him up too bad because there aren't as many of them there. And if he has any success, the, there's only three coaches that have ever won the Super Bowl National Championship. You had Jimmy Johnson, Barry Switzer, although he had his handed to him. Uh, Jimmy Johnson, of course, you have Pete Carroll as well. So if Urban Meyer can put himself in select company, and my goodness, you know, that would be unbelievable. Rick? <laughs> yeah, I heard about it, and I was kind of like, wow, he's going to the pros, huh? So that should be very interesting. But like I said, $12 million a year uh, he's reportedly getting doesn't hurt as well. So, And you got the number one pick, all this cap space in Jacksonville. You know, it's, you don't, you know, you people are all excited about Tampa Bay and uh, Tom Brady. And, you know, you got the Dolphins with Tua, and they're kind of like on the underground. So there's really not that that pressure. I mean, if he goes 10 and six and goes to the playoffs his first year, they probably will build a statue for him, you know, seriously, because, you know, they're, they're really, they're, you know, they have never, they've never been to a Super Bowl, and, you know, um, they're not really like, they're sort of a younger, you know, younger team. They're not too uh, old in the NFL. So they're, they're just trying to get some type of culture there and getting one of the greatest coaches in college to come there is great. And getting the number one pick who's, might be the next Pate Manning. I mean, he's been reported to be uh, the number one pick ever since he was a freshman. And I agree with Mel, you know, no state income tax there. It's a great place to go. It's a smaller market. And so there's not that pressure to win right away where, in, where you're not like in Dallas or, you know, or Alabama where you have to win right away. So I think it's great. And I love to see it happen. And I hope he's successful. I think the only thing that might hurt him is his health. I know he's had some health problems over the last, uh, time i know he left ohio so he had some health problems and in florida he had some health problems so hopefully uh he's healthy and ready to go and uh, to me that's the only thing that could uh, probably stop him from not being successful in the nfl you know for some crazy reason and i and i repeat it's a crazy reason here 
I wouldn't be surprised to see him bring in Tim Tebow in some way, shape, or form, whether it's an offensive consultant or anything like that. You know, and Tim Tebow is obviously a local kid as well. I mean, again, obviously we didn't think his skills translated into the pro game. He was a good college player. He's a hard nose. He teaches work ethic. He's from the area. And you never know. I mean, again, everything will depend on his coaching staff. And I know that he's been assembling that coaching staff for a while anyway. So, you know, it's not like this is a surprise hire. This has been in the works. I know Shad Khan has done his due diligence. I can tell you right now, can you imagine, should there be fans next year with the spike and season tickets will be? Because right now, you know, they're not sure if they're going to get that London game at all. No contract has been renewed, and that's what kept them uh, 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 in the black instead of the red. They depend on those games in London just to be able to, you know, survive as a franchise. So, again, you'll put bodies in the seats, and uh, it, to me, it's I believe it has the makings to be a heck of a hire. I really do. And he's revered there. It's going to take time. He's not used to losing one or two games a year, and he's going to lose a lot at the beginning. So, again, can he handle losing a lot of it at the beginning? Can he turn it around five to seven games? I don't know if there's anybody that can do it. I think it's him, but I think right now they certainly should feel very good in Jacksonville. And with me having worked up there many times, I know what kind of a fan base and everything is all about. So uh, kudos to the Jaguars. You know, I wish them well. They've been they've treated me really well and candy as well. So, all right, we'll go from the Jacksonville Jaguars to a team Mel, that we're all too familiar with. The Detroit Lions hired Rams executive uh, Brad Holmes to be their uh, general manager. He was a finalist of the Atlanta Falcons job. He lives in the Atlanta area, and L.A. will be uh, the first team to receive two third-round compensatory picks because of the minority incentives that were attached to this situation. He played a major role in the Rams' last eight drafts. Amongst some of the names are Aaron Donald, Jared Goff, Todd Gurley, Cooper Cup. And, of course, he's been, uh, like I said, been with the Rams a long time. He started there in 2003, and obviously that's when he moved into the scouting side, but he started as an intern. If there's, And I know he was a highly coveted candidate. I think the Lions knew that he had to go ahead. They had to make a move on him because if they didn't, I think he would have gone to the Atlanta Falcons. So once you get a guy in the building, Mel, you ought to know as well as anybody, you got to just close the deal and button it up. And bear in mind, he's just in time there to try to go ahead and have a hand and selecting the next head coach. So the Lions had to get that hire quickly. So Mel, you know, obviously Luther Bradley, I believe, is a, he's related to Luther Bradley, and you have deep LA ties. What are your thoughts about the Brad Holmes hire for the Lions? Did they finally get it right? Yeah, Luther Bradley is his uh, uncle, from my right. understanding. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, I don't know. I don't know very much about him. What I am excited to see is that he is a minority and they're giving a, a minority an opportunity. A couple of days ago, or it might have been last week, or earlier in the week, Chris Spielman had a, a Zoom call with a lot of the legends of the Detroit Lions. And my brother was on the call. And Chris assured us that we will see a championship in our lifetime. So I guess this could be the start of it by, by, getting, the, by getting a general manager in there. Uh, the next thing we do, the next thing we have to do is we got to get ourselves a head coach in there and and, and we'll take it from there. And they have to make a decision, obviously, on what they want to do with Matthew Stafford. I don't know whether or not they want to go forward with Matthew Stafford, try to trade him and try to get some picks and just go ahead and, and you know, re tear this thing down to the studs. Or if they want to try to add some pieces while you still have Matthew Stafford playing at a at a pretty high level and see what he can do with a with a new uh, with a new head coach and a, and a new offensive coordinator. But yeah, I'm excited about the pick. I'm excited about it being an African American, get an opportunity to have a front office position there again. Um, you know, I know Martin Mayhew, he had the, he had the opportunity a while ago, and uh, so it's nice to see uh, uh, Bradley get this opportunity. And we look forward to seeing what he'll be able to do. Well, the Lions did their due diligence. They had t 12 interviews for the general manager job, so it's not like they picked the first two or three. Obviously, I know a popular choice during the early part of the process was Lewis Riddick. He has been an analyst, but I think the thing that's doomed Riddick is me. He's been out of it for so long and been in television so long. The Lions haven't had a lot, even though when they hired Matt Millen, you can't compare Millen to Riddick, okay? You really can't. But when you're away from it, as long as you are like Lewis Riddick, and you have a lot of guys that are actively involved, 
that, that's important. Another thing I should point out, going back to Urban Meyer for a moment, he knows the college game really well, both as a commentator, and he's not that far removed from coaching as well, so that will help the Jaguars. But back onto the Lions, you know, so I think you've got a guy that's been in an organization 17 years, and as I understand, Barry Sanders has been involved in this process as well. The Lions are trying to get all their great football minds, something that Sheila Hamp Ford has been able to do this time around or Ford Hamp, whatever, doesn't matter. But, you know, she's bringing a lot of people involved, a lot of opinions involved in this whole thing. And when you think about the fact they got Barry, Chris Fieldman, I think they finally did some due diligence here with this guy and he has a good track record for the Rams. So when you think of they're just a couple of years, I think, removed from a Super Bowl appearance and the nucleus that they have. And, and don't discount the fact that they're still playing, and we'll get to the Rams momentarily. And I'm sure he was probably behind, or at least I didn't say, in Jalen Ramsey being, you know, uh, acquired as well. So, you know, more power to them. But they did their due diligence at 12 GM candidates. Rick, what do you want to add to this? Yeah, I think it's a great hire. It's always great to see more minorities, you know, in the NFL. And uh, we'll see what happens. Still early in the process. be interesting to see who they're uh, – who they have as their coach. That's probably, the, that's the next step for them. And um, we'll just take it from there and see what happens, you know? So, um, you know, it's a, it's a first step, you know, and they, like I, like you guys said, that see what they're going to do with Stafford, you know, um, that's going to be the big question. Are they going to keep him? Is he, is he going to leave? You know, it might be good for him. It's, I think it'll be good for him, you know, sort of like a new uh, change of scenery. He's done all he could do there. He's been great there. You know, it's just unfortunately the culture there for so long was just not very good. But, you know, I think um, this is the right step in the right direction and uh, kind of curious to see what they get to, as their head coach. Well, I disagree with anybody that thinks Stafford should leave. Playing at the top level, he just needs a good coach, a good offensive coordinator. And, you know, who are you going to get? Who are you really going to get? Me personally, I've always loved Matt Stafford, and he's not the problem. He can be part of the solution. You just and Daryl Bevel, if he's hired full time, he's already indicated he's going to keep him anyways. So you know, I don't think the situation with Stafford. I think another guy who I think could get that job if it isn't going to be Bevel, be Robert Slay. If he's not taken by the New York Jets, he's already had two interviews with the Jets, and he's a hot candidate. But if you know, uh, Soleil is gone, then uh, I'd be anxious to see where they're going to go. I don't know whether Eric Bieniemy will be available or whether he'd want to take. P. What's that? What about Dougie P? Doug, Doug Peterson. Peterson. Right now, I don't know, but could he screw up Matt Stafford? That would be the thing. <laughs> Did he screw up Carson Wentz, or or did they have overevaluate him, have him overrated? I, I think know. Carson Wentz screwed Carson Wentz up. I really do. Matthew Stafford's got 40,000 yards, okay, 45,000 yards. He, he's not going to get screwed up by Peterson, but I don't think Peterson gets hired right away. I'd like, Unless I'd like, to, I'd like to see him go to Detroit, to be honest with you. Well, Joe, I, I have a yeah. gut feeling if Peterson goes anywhere, it would be with the Jets. That would be my guess. But it's a guess. But next week, we'll, I'm sure we'll be talking a different tune when we do this again next week. So we'll go from there. So, all right, let's go ahead and uh, – and recap wild card uh, week. Uh, I'm going to go each game individually. The Buffalo Bills uh, held on to beat the Indianapolis Colts 27 24, which that game lived up to its billing as being a good football game. Phillip Rivers had a nice game, night season. But Buffalo, a team that would scare the daylights out of anybody, did prevail. So, Mel, what are your thoughts about how Buffalo handled Indianapolis? Yeah, I think it was, uh, it was a good game. Uh, you know, Indianapolis, yeah, Indianapolis had its chances. Um, but uh, for whatever reason, you know, they just they just came a little they came up a little bit short. I think Buffalo is you know they kind of um, uh, they're they're on a path they're 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 kind of kind of have a, have a destiny I guess. Uh, uh, the way they've been playing has been very intentional, and these guys are, are are looking forward to continuing on in the playoffs and, and possibly making a run for the Super Bowl. So. You know, look forward. You know, they, it's they've grown every year. Buffalo has grown every year. They've gotten better every year. The quarterback is playing at a high level this year. Uh, they got the wide receiver. They got Stephon Diggs. They had right. brought him over from Minnesota, and he's been he's been playing lights out. Uh, and you know, with that defense, has been playing. You know, they've they've been playing phenomenal as well. So, 
um, you know, look forward to you know seeing what Buffalo can do. See if they can finally get over the hump. You know, if they have to make it to the Super Bowl and, and get over the hump and, and win one. But you know, it's been you know it's been good football, good to look at. Really excited for the people in Buffalo. It's been a long time. You know, it's been a long time since it, since um, you know they they could feel good about uh, their football team there in Buffalo. Kind of like how you know it's been a long time for us in Detroit as well. But right. we won't get into that. But yeah. I thought it was a good game and, and look forward to uh, them playing this week. Even though that was a 2-7 seed, I don't care what the seeding is. Throw that right out the window. That was a 4-5 type of seeding. It's just how it worked out. So, you know, that game lived up to expectations. It really, really, really did. Jonathan Taylor's a great running back for the Indianapolis Colts. And, of course, the Buffalo Bills has uh, their own running back from Florida Atlantic University. Devin Singletary is a good player. And they've got a lot of good pieces over there. We're going to get to them later on when we go into this weekend's games. Rick, what are your thoughts about that uh, Buffalo-Indianapolis game? Oh, it was a really good game. I watched it. It was really good. It looked like Buffalo was going to run away with it. And then little by little, Indianapolis was coming back. Rivers had a good game. You know, he had a really strong second half. He struggled in the first half. And I hope to see him again. You know, he's still – you know, his numbers were really good, you know, if you look at it. So um, it was a good game. And, uh, you know, Buffalo, I mean, it's just, they haven't won a playoff game in, like, in eons, you know. And it's so good to see them back, you know, when I was growing up, you know, them going to the Super Bowl all the time, four straight Super Bowls. And, uh, and then all of a sudden they just had no success. And now they're, like, one of the best teams right now. And, yeah, I, I would be afraid of them. I would If I was Kansas City or, you know, anybody, I would be afraid of them. So – um, they're the team to look out for. And, um, you know, Josh Allen is just um, every year he's getting better and better. He's just he's uh, he's been an amazing uh, uh, quarterback in the NFL. And uh, I didn't think he'd be that good right away. So um, kudos to him. And uh, they, they really have it going on right now in Buffalo. Yeah, I actually saw Jacksonville defeat Buffalo 10-3 to a few years ago, but it was just good to see that they got in the playoffs at Jacksonville. And Jacksonville was on a good roll there, even with Blake Bortles, to get to the AFC Championship game. I know they fell a few minutes short, but it's good to see Buffalo competitive again and in the playoffs. And they're a product exactly what the Lions hope to follow, where you have a young general manager and a young coach on the same page. And if you duplicate that formula and and the quarterback's there, that's a model that a lot of um, teams are following, just like having with the Rams. you got Sean McVay and Les Snead. So if you can come up with a good working combination, then you don't quit on the quarterback. You really don't. All right, the L.A. Rams, 30. The Seattle Seahawks, 20. Uh, Don Wolford got hurt, but bum thumb or not, Okay, Jared Goff came in there, and I'll tell you what, that Rams defense made Russell Wilson look like he should have been running uh, for cover because he could sue for non-support with the way the Rams defense mauled him. So, okay, Rick, uh, you know, your own hometown, the Rams, were you, did, did you see that coming? No, I did, and I thought Seattle was going to win, especially in Seattle. Um, you know, I know they didn't have their fans. They have, like, one of the most loudest fans there, and unfortunately because COVID, they didn't have that. Um, I was very surprised by it, you know, and, you know, I, Russell Wilson is an amazing quarterback, but he can only do what you can. Seattle just, they don't have anything. They really don't. If it wasn't for Russell Wilson there, they would be like a five and 11 team, six and 10 team without him there. So he can do all he can. He, they need to get an offensive line to help him instead of him running for his dear life. And the Rams look like they're playing their best football right now with their defense right now. And, um, you know, golf came and he, he did well, you know, and um, so it was a very good game. I didn't see it happening. I had Seattle winning that game, but um, kudos to the Rams. And that, that was like a, to me, a mild upset on that one. So we'll see what happens, but Seattle, they really need to, uh, they need some massive help because uh, Russell can't do it all by himself. Well, Mel, obviously you have LA ties. I'm sure you had to feel pretty good that the Rams pulled that one out, weren't you? Uh, yeah, I mean, they look good. You know, defense wins championships, and their defense is playing lights out right now. Uh, you know, Seattle, in the beginning of the year, they're talking about letting Russ cook, and you know, I don't know what happened. They started letting Russ cook a little bit. Things weren't going that well. Their big problem is they can't run the football. They have not been able to run the football. Uh, towards the end of the year, you know, they, they just had not been playing very well offensively, and obviously, you know, that's probably, probably one of the reasons why Schottenheimer ended up losing his job as an offensive coordinator right. there. Because they have not played well offensively, they they played terribly offensively. Uh, you know, uh, 
the the way that you know the way that they were able to to get after Russell Wilson in that game, Russell Wilson, I mean, he just had no time whatsoever. And when they're not fearful, when your team is not fearful of a running game, all they do is pin their ears back and they, and they, they just go for broke. And they just harassed him all day long. Um, the, ran, the Seattle has some big problems. They had some problems offensively and they had some problems defensively. I don't know if it's schematically the problems defensively or if it's personnel wise. You know, they have some names over there. Person, they have some names over there on the defense. But defensively, they just they have not been playing well, and they, they don't scare anybody anymore like they did when they had the Legion of Boom. So there's a lot of things that have to take place over there in Seattle. I think uh, – uh, no, I'm not sure. No, they didn't bring anybody back. But uh, they, got, they, they, got a, they have some things that they have to work on offensively and defensively. they got to figure out what it is, who they want to be offensively. Uh, do they want to run the football? They're going to let Russ, Russell Wilson cook. I, I know Pete Carroll, he wants to run the football. You know, he, he wants to run the football and he wants to play good defense. So we'll have to see what happens here in the offseason. Yeah, without a doubt. All right, well, Tampa defeated the Washington football team 31-23. I think it was interesting to see Chase Young want Tom Brady. And uh, you know what? Chase Young's a stud. He really is. And I admire the fact that he wanted to face Brady. And I know that from what I hear, they were talking to each other after the game. But, you know, Chase Young is going to be heard from for a long time. And Tom Brady had a pretty good game. They're playing a lot better down the stretch. Him and Arians finally seem like they're on the same page. But I think what's interesting about that game is Antonio Brown is starting to get into a rhythm here. He really is. And, of course, they have a lot of good weapons. They have Leonard Fournette. But, you know, I got to give the Washington football team a lot of credit with the backup quarterback taking over. Was it, I think, Taylor Heineke, I believe it is? Yeah. And I'll tell you what, this kid here deserves a chance to compete for the starting job for Washington. You know they're going to draft a quarterback anyways because they're not sure what's going to happen with Alex Smith. I think for Alex Smith just to even play this year is going out on top. And you know full well that I believe the Washington football team will draft a quarterback. We won't get into that now. But what are your thoughts about the Tampa-Washington game, Mel? It was a good game. Uh, you, you know, Tampa's one of those teams that offensively, you can see they're getting better week in and week out. They get more comfortable with one another. They didn't have the OTAs. They didn't have training camp or, or a long training camp to try to work on getting that, that rhythm and, and developing a, a chemistry where Tom Brady didn't have the opportunity to develop a chemistry with the, with the wide receivers and the, and the tight ends. So he's kind of had to do that in season. And you see that they're, you know, they're playing better offensively. Whereas teams like, you know, Seattle, as we talked about, and Pittsburgh, uh, they, they were playing, you know, they're playing their worst football at the worst possible time when they need to be playing their best football. So right now, offensively, Tampa Bay is playing some of their best football. And uh, I was very impressed with the quarterback for Washington. I mean, he played lights out. I mean, he gave them every opportunity to win a lot more of an opportunity than uh, than, than the uh, the guy they ended up letting go from Ohio State. I can't think of his name right now. Yeah, Haskins. Blaine Haskins. Blaine Haskins. I mean, he, he, man, I couldn't believe this guy. I mean, the guy was on the streets, you know, 60 days ago. And uh, I think he was, you know, taking some, some uh, classes on, online. And he, he played lights out. I mean, he played outstanding football. Real, real happy, happy for him in the, in the way that he performed. And I think he's earned an opportunity uh, to at least compete and be on somebody's roster next year as, as a backup, if, you know, if not, you know, possibly have an opportunity to start somewhere. Well, first of all, this kid here, okay, came off the practice squad because they were really running into problems. And you know what? This kid here is headed to your territory, Rick, out in Charlotte. I think they're giving him a look. So, but we'll talk about Haskins another time. But yeah, I, yeah. I there's no question. I think he caught the attention of Ron Rivera with the mobility and the poise he showed under very tough circumstances. So, Rick, what's your take out of the Tampa Washington game? Well, it was a really good game. You know, Heineke actually used to be a quarterback for the Panthers. So, you know, Ron Rivera was a head coach there. So that, okay. that was one of the reasons he got him there. And then he was in the XFL with the St. Louis Battlehawks. So he is a good quarterback. You know, I've seen him play a couple he's times. A backup for the Battlehawks. Yeah, he was a backup there. Yep, exactly. So, and, uh, you know, he played very, very well, you know. And, I mean, I mean, that division, you know, was a very good division. So, and I think everybody had Tampa Bay winning it. And uh, he – just said, there's no pressure on me. I'm going to play lights out. And he played really, really well. And uh, a lot of people on Twitter were just praising him and just saying, hey, man, you, you, were, you were great. So, I mean, he, I mean, why not, why not be uh, 
for the starting quarterback job, you know, and I think the question mark is, is Alex Smith going to come back? He's still playing. He played great for a guy who hadn't played football in two years, a guy that almost died, a guy that almost got his leg amputated. You know, man, he played well. I mean, he was the reason why the Washington football team went to the playoffs, you know, before him, you know, that Haskins with all his issues and drama and they looked like they were a mess, you know, so um, we'll see what happens with Alex Smith, but, um, you know, another uh, notch for Tom Brady and, and uh, it's going to be a great game between him and Breeze. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you what, the draft this year has some really good quarterbacks. So there's no doubt a, a, a franchise quarterback or quarterback of the future, I should say, should fall to Washington. But yes, indeed, you guys are right about that. All right, let's talk about the Sunday games. Baltimore take on beat Tennessee twenty to thirteen. You know what? You, you had Lamar Jackson against Derrick Henry. I told you, I saw Derrick Henry play. He's a stud. But I'll tell you, Lamar Jackson got the monkey off his back by finally winning a playoff game. So all the people in the media can leave him alone. Got it, got the win, and now find something else to talk or write about. So, all right, Rick, what are your thoughts about the Tennessee Baltimore game? Well, that was a great game. You know, I was excited to see Henry and, uh, you know, they, they stopped him. They really did. You know, he did. They, they just crowded the box and just got him and he had nowhere to go. So, I mean, they did a great job in planning to uh, stop him and Jackson. Yeah, you're right. He got that monkey off his back. People have been criticizing him. I've been hard on him as well saying, you know, he needs to win and he did and uh, went to Tennessee and, it was a, a, a good win for them, and uh, we'll see what happens with uh, with the Ravens, but a, a great solid win for them. And, uh, you know, Tennessee had a great year, you know, and they've, they've been improving. And, uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago that they were not that good. So, you know, they got a great, to me, the best running back in the NFL, Henry. And just unfortunately, you just got to tip your hat off to uh, Baltimore and Jackson for just playing a great game. Well, I do know that the offensive coordinator for Tennessee is interviewing for head coaching jobs, Mel. So what's your take on the uh, Baltimore Ravens going into Music City and t- uh, earning a victory in Tennessee? Well, I mean, they did what they, they needed to do. Uh, they they uh, went in there and they made Tennessee one-dimensional. If you're going to beat us, Tannehill is going to beat us. Uh, Henry is not going to beat us. And uh, they stacked the box and and they kept him under control, and by being able, by doing that, they're also able to control uh, Ryan Tannehill. Now, the question that Lamar has to answer is whether or not a team with a predominantly running quarterback can win a Super Bowl. That's the next question that they have to answer. So, yeah, you won, you won a playoff game, but you know you're not in this thing to win playoff games. You're in this thing to win Super Bowl. So now we have to see if we can take it to take it to the level where if you if you can win if you can win it all with a predominantly running quarterback and if you're able to do that you'll probably see a lot of things change in NFL health they might even come back and bring the wishbone back who knows I don't know but uh, (laughs) it will be it will be interesting to see if you can win if you can win it all with a with a great defense and a and a predominant a quarterback that is a predominantly a runner like we need any more trends to take place in college but yeah there's there's certainly Mel like you said a great deal of intrigue to what you're talking about for sure all right, well, the Chicago Bears and New Orleans Saints, 21-9. to nine. I think the Bears' defense simply wore out. I mean, you've got to score some points. You really do. They didn't look good in their loss of Green Bay at the end of the year, and they certainly looked a lot worse. And yet, meanwhile, the general manager and the head coach at least retained their job for one more year, although the Bears will be looking for another quarterback. But we'll talk about the game first and foremost. Drew Brees over Mitch Trubisky. If this wasn't a mismatch, tell me what the word mismatch is, Malfar. Uh, I mean, you know, Chicago had their chances in this football game. They, they, uh, New Orleans left the door open for them on multiple occasions to, to be able to stay in this football game, and Chicago just wasn't able to answer the bell. Um, you know, they just can't do anything efic- efficiently, offensively, with Trubisky at the helm. And it's, it's unfortunate because they got a very, very good defense. Their, de- their defense, with that type of defense, you're going to have an opportunity to win football games. Right. It's just unfortunate that, you know, the quarterback, well, the, you know, the coach is an offensive coach, offensive, I guess, guru, and they can't get anything out of that. They can't get anything out of the offense. They can't score any points. And that's, you know, in this league, you have to be able to put some points up on the board in order to win. And it's just unfortunate for Chicago. You know, I was rooting for Chicago. 
obviously, you know, not obviously, but I was rooting for Chicago. And, you know, unfortunately for Tampa Bay, uh, because, you know, because New Orleans did win that, well, because because they did win that game, um, you know, that's who they have to play. And uh, Tampa Bay is not play, has not played New Orleans very well. New Orleans has had their way with, with Tampa Bay. But it's very difficult to beat a team, you know, twice in a year. Uh, it's really difficult to beat a team three times. So we'll have to see what happens. Yeah, but the main thing is Chicago hasn't had a franchise quarterback since 1940. I believe it was what Sid Luckman was the last franchise quarterback that they had. And more importantly, when you think about it, the one that they had that pretty much resembled a franchise quarterback to me would have been Jim McMahon. And I love Jim, Jim McMahon mm-hmm. in 1985. And they ran him out of town. So game was, know, the game was way too much for uh, Chicago, for sure. And uh, eight and eight get you in the playoffs. Uh, give him another year and see what happens. What are you going to say, Mel? No, I was just saying that, you know, when Jim McMahon was at the helm, the game was different, too. I mean, it was more run or now. You know, the quarterback has a lot more responsibilities than the quarterback now. Right. Other than, you know, well, even with Baltimore, there's a lot of responsibility on, on Lamar at the quarterback position, but not to throw the football, but to be able to run the football. So, Rick, your observations about New Orleans, Chicago. Yeah, I mean, that wasn't a big surprise. You know, I think Chicago was like the weakest team to get in there. I mean, I think, you know, the Washington team was better. You know, it just was not a big surprise. I've never been sold on Trubisky. I said he's overrated, and they drafted him way too high. He played in, you know, in Chapel Hill. So I saw a lot of the games, and he was just like whatever. But it was such a weak quarterback draft that year that, and uh, the general manager of the Bears should be lucky so has his job because he's the one that drafted Trubisky. And not only that, but he 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 went up a spot and gave away some draft picks to get him. And Trubisky, to me, has just been a, a nothing but, he, uh, you know, a disappointment. But I'm not really surprised. So we'll see what happens with the with the Saints. You know, it's going to be the game right there, Brady versus Breeze. But, um, yeah, I agree with Mel. The, the Bears have a very, very good defense. Just they cannot score points. And Trubisky is the weak link. And, and uh, I mean, if, if I was the Bears – it would not be hard for me to think of what to do. It's just, it's time to move on and get a new quarterback because Trubisky is just not the answer. Well, I know when people say, well, we could add this quarterback, we could add that quarterback. You know, I don't know that when you're drafting quarterbacks, so they're really going to turn yeah. out. Yeah. I mean, sure. Deshaun Watson went behind it, but I don't buy that. Full or Mahomes. Yeah. Right. I don't, I don't buy that. You know what? If we, if the job was so easy that we could evaluate quarterbacks that so we'd be in it instead of the people that are actually doing it. You know, that, that's the quarterback that they felt. They went after him, didn't work out, but life goes on. You know, I think there's another quarter. They could draft another quarterback if they wanted to. I mm-hmm. think this quarterback draft is deep. One more game from last week, and, you know, amazingly enough, when I thought that Pittsburgh rested their starters, that they were hoping that they'd get the favorable matchup with Cleveland and that they had won 17 straight at home. Well, you know what? They didn't work <laughs> out so good because they got Cleveland – and Cleveland was without their head coach, Kevin Stefanski, and they had a couple of coaches out, a couple of players. Didn't stop Baker Mayfield from taking care of business. But, all right, Rick, so 48-37 in favor of Pittsburgh with a substitute coach. My goodness, this one shocked a lot of people. Yeah, when I saw it was 28 nothing, I had to like, like, what? And like the Browns? And I go, the Browns. And I was like, what happened to Pittsburgh? They just absolutely fell apart. My goodness gracious, you know, and now this, what's going to happen with Roethlisberger now? Is he going to come back? Is he going to stay? You know, he's got one year left. That's going to be interesting right there. But you got to give it to the Browns. You know, I've been calling them the bad news Browns. They've been the bad news Browns for a long, long time. And, you know, I talk about Alex Smith being comeback player of the decade. How about Stefanski? He should be a coach of the millennium over the uh, 100 years. I mean, to get this team that has no culture of winning that has just been bad luck and just not do anything. And uh, look what, look what he's done. And they just made a huge statement and, you know, and then you hear Pittsburgh crying, you know, you hear Juju should have kept his mouth shut for one thing. I think he learned, hopefully he learned his lesson, but nobody saw this coming. Nobody. I mean, uh, I think some people may have had Cleveland winning the game, but not like this, not a 20, nothing route like this on the road. And uh, Pittsburgh had all their starters. So um, Pittsburgh's got some, um, you know, some questions right now to answer, see what happens with Roethlisberger. But you really got to give it to the Browns. And, you know, and they, uh, they, they've surprised me right now. So good luck. You know, I'm happy for them. 
Well, Pittsburgh's made some coaching changes today, as I understand it. So, you know, obviously Mike Tomlin trying to get that staff in order. And Ben Roethlisberger, by the way, I think is set to make $41 million. So if he comes back, they're going to have to rework that contract to get him some more pieces. So they'll be anxious to see what happens in Steeltown. So, Mel, were you really surprised that the Cleveland Browns shorthanded were able to beat the Pittsburgh Steelers on, in their own field? No, not really. I mean, you look, you look at how Pittsburgh are playing as of late. They haven't been playing that well. Uh, right. they, they can't run the football, and, and they couldn't run the football on, on that day. And then they turn the ball over a lot. When you turn the ball over today, they turn the ball over and you give Cleveland, who, you know, they're a good football team. They have some good players on their side. Those guys get paid every every other Monday, too. Right. And you turn the ball over the way that they did. It's going to be – you make it very difficult. And it's going to be uphill all day long. They turn the ball over, uh, gave Cleveland a full field, and Cleveland was able to take advantage of it and come out with touchdowns and that field goals. And when you get behind like that, and you have to have Big Ben drop back, drop back fifty to sixty times. That's right. a, that's not a recipe for for winning football. No, I just said that's a recipe for disaster, and you're probably going to be on the short end of that stick. And they they ended up on the short end of that deal. Um, and they so they have a lot of things that they have to evaluate. They got a great defense. They got a young defense. They had some injuries on the defensive side of the ball from some key players. But they're obviously going to get back next year. I see they just got rid of their offensive coordinator, and they also got their offensive line coach. Right. Mistaken. So there's some things that uh, philosophy-wise, we know what Pittsburgh is. We know who they are. We know what they want to do. Um, you know, James Conner doesn't look the same uh, as he did in years past. I don't know what you know what what's going on there, but they've got to be able to run that football and have the threat of being able to run the football and that opens up everything else for them. Uh, it just can't. You can't ask Ben to drop back fifty six times a game. It's just not going to be good. I mean, you see that he, you know, he's a little careless with the ball. I mean, you see how many interceptions he threw last week. And I don't know if his arm is. You know, I don't know if his arm is is, is you know, it, is is if, he, if it's ever ever going to be the way it was prior to his injury. I don't know if Big Ben will ever be the Big Ben that he used to be. Because, you know, after the surgery that he had, so uh, they have some questions to answer, to answer that position as well. Okay, all right, let's go on to the uh, divisional round here, the tournament. First game on Saturday uh, takes place at 435 Eastern time. The LA Rams take on the Green Bay Packers. Well, this is what the Packers have played for, an opportunity to play cold weather games at Lambeau Field. Aaron Donald and company, of course, they'll have Jared Goff at the helm. Backup quarterback is skit, should be Blake Bortles. John Wolford has, has been ruled out for it. So, you know, Jared Goff will be playing on a bum thumb. So, Mel, what are your takes about the Rams in Lambeau Field? The defense is going to give them a chance. You know, the defense, they got the number one defense. That's going to give them an opportunity. You know, maybe give them some short fields, give them an opportunity to get some some cheap points on the board, some easy points on the board. It's, I'm sure it's going to be difficult with Goff only having the surgery three weeks ago. Uh, that cold weather, I can't imagine that's going to help. So, uh, you know, it's going, it's going to be tough. But, I mean, football this time of the year is tough. I don't care who it is. I, I, you know, everybody's a little banged up. Um, but uh, I, I, I feel that, uh, you know, because of all, because of all offensive inefficiencies, inefficiencies that, uh, or de- deficiencies of, of the Rams, I think that Green Bay will probably win this game. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I have Green Bay in this. I mean, they're in Lambeau Field, the cold. You know, you got L.A. Yeah, they don't get snow up there. Trust me, I'm, I'm from there. So, you know, that's going to be problematic for them. You know, Rams are a little banged up. Rodgers is playing at a high, high caliber. He's probably going to be the MVP. Um, they just look really good, the Packers. To me, this is like a, you know, the thing that's going to keep the Rams is the defense. That's it. If they can, like, pester uh, Aaron Rodgers like they did with uh, – uh, like they did with Russell Wilson, it's a tall order, but they can do it. I mean, they'll keep him in the game, but I just think Green Bay is just a better team, and uh, Rodgers is playing out of his mind, and they're playing at Lambeau Field and in the cold. So I have the Packers winning this, and I just think it's it's going to be a a pretty one sided game. I think, like I said, we'll start out slow. Um, I think the Rams defense will do well, but the Packers is just too much. I'm not going against Aaron Rodgers in this football game in Lambeau Field. He yeah. won the second Super Bowl title. 
you never know. Would he want to retire at that particular point, go out and dump? Although I don't think Aaron Rodgers is ready to retire. He's got some great football ahead of him. Records to be broken in number. And more importantly, you get a second Super Bowl in Green Bay, let alone a first Super Bowl, you know. But, yeah, no, there's no way I'll go against Aaron Rodgers at Lambeau Field for sure. Green Bay, I don't know, I'd say at least 10 points. And, you know, again, if Aaron Donald keeps him at least close, uh, it'll be competitive for three quarters. But, again, we, we don't know what type of weather conditions are in Florida. I just know they're going to be cold. So, Rodgers all the way by at least 10 points. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, you want to talk about the game of the week, Baltimore against Buffalo. Uh, snow, they're looking at snow in the forecast. Slick field. This is the first meeting in the playoffs for these two teams. Baltimore is one of the last three regular season meetings. And, you know, you Buffalo goes into this game with a seven game winning streak and Baltimore goes in with a six game winning streak. So, you know, you got Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, and of course you got Stefan Diggs who's playing out of his mind. Devin Singletary can be pretty quiet. Uh, well, he could come out. You never know. It depends on how efficient they are with the field conditions. So, Mel, why don't you take a stab at this Baltimore Buffalo game? Yeah, I want to make a point on the the, the last game, the Rams and, and Cleveland, real quick. Yeah. You know, uh, Green Bay is going to be out with it. Is going to be without their All Pro tackle. Right, hurt his leg, hurt his knee. He's going to be out for the rest of the season. That could be that could be big here as well. Um, with with Aaron, you know, with that with that defensive line that the, that the Rams have, being able to get after Aaron Rodgers, but um, Buffalo game and in uh, Baltimore game, I'm looking forward to it. These are two teams that like to run the football, want to run the football, want to play hard nose, smash mouth football, the kind of football that we kind of grew up on. But it's going to be a tough game to pick, you know. As much as I as much as I like Baltimore and their defense and what they're able to do defensively, I just don't think that Lamar does enough for them offensively throwing the football. Um, to, to give them a chance to win. I think that Josh Allen does do enough, even though, you know, he runs the football, he moves pretty well. He runs with the football and he moves pretty well, but obviously he throws the ball much better than, uh, than Lamar does. And so I think that uh, they, the Buffalo will, 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 ha- will have a package to be able, in place to be able to contain Lamar Jackson, to try to make him beat them with his arm and not with his legs. Uh, I think that McDermott is smart enough to try to, you know, to, to put that into place. And I think that Buffalo will win this football game. Yeah, I think the only thing that stops Lamar Jackson from running is the snow and the slick conditions. Because if you have a clear football field and there are no snowy conditions, I give him a puncher's chance. But I think that when you're dealing with a very, very, uh, uh, like I say, a very mobile quarterback that can run, that's what Lamar will have his way. All right, I'll, before I get on to my prediction, Rick, give me your thoughts on this football game. Yeah, I, I have Buffalo winning this. I don't think it's going to be as close as a lot of people think it is. I just think the NFL, you know, uh, you, you just need to be a, a pocket quarterback. I just don't believe that the NFL, you could be a, a running quarterback like a Lamar Jackson, you know, to be to win it all in the NFL. In college, it works, but in the NFL, it's totally different. And, um, you know, Josh Allen's a pocket quarterback and he can run too. He, he is, he is good at that. He's deceiving because he's so tall. A lot of people don't expect him to be a, a fast runner, but Buffalo's so hungry right now. You know, they've been waiting for this for like decades, you know, cause they've been so bad and I just really have them winning in this. I just think right now they're playing really, really well. And Baltimore, like I said, they're going to, like Mel said, they're going to force Lamar to throw the ball. And they're not going to get him to run. They're going to stop him to run. And I just don't see him running for 100 yards. I think he's going to have like a lot of attempts and he's going to struggle. And I, I have I have Buffalo win this pretty, pretty, pretty easily. OK, well, bear in mind that while I've talked about Lamar Jackson not having a lot of experience playing in the snow, Josh Allen played for the University of Wyoming Cowboys. Yeah. Playing snow up there. They really do. And he, he's a pretty mobile quarterback. But he, but obviously he's known for just passing as well. But oh, put nothing past Josh Allen from a mobility standpoint. He knows how to get the yards that he does. He can do both. It just so happens on a running side, Lamar Jackson does the running a whole lot better. But nobody wanted to play for quarterback in Buffalo. They they developed their own, and this guy here, you know, along with Jim Kelly, you may be looking at two quarterback statues. Uh, out there, and he'll definitely be headed for the ring of honor. But, yeah, I like the Buffalo Bills in this football game. They seem like 
to me, to be a team of destiny. They really do. And I love everything that they're doing. I pointed out to you that you have a good general manager and a good coach on the same page. And again, this is a formula of, for success. So I'll give Buffalo a win, but I, I'm going to give them a seven point win. I think it could be very interesting. And I only say seven because of the weather conditions to keep it a little closer. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, we'll talk about Sunday. England Browns get their coach back, Kansas City Chiefs. That game starts at 3.05 out in Kansas City. All right, Rick, lead off of this one. Now, I can't go against Patrick Mahomes. You know, Kansas City's defending champions. They want to prove that, you know, they're, they're, they want to break that, uh, that, you know, that curse of the Super Bowl, like you get in and the next year you're not that good or whatever. So they're, they're just playing great. Patrick Mahomes is like, one of the best quarterbacks, or to me, the best quarterback in the NFL right now, and um, Andy Reid, and um, they just got everything going for them. They're in Kansas City and uh, Cleveland. You've had a great year. You shocked me with Pittsburgh, especially going up 28 nothing. so I didn't see that coming, but I, I just have Kansas City winning this, and if Browns win this, man, I'll uh, – <laughs> You know, my really tip my hat off to them, but I just think Kansas City, their offense is just so, so explosive. And um, I just I just love everything about Patrick Mahomes. He's so calm. He's poised. You don't see him going, getting erratic or yelling or screaming. He's just calm. And I, I just love his demeanor and how he plays the game. So I, I have Kansas City winning this. Well, you'll be talking about it next week. So we'll find out what you really have to say about this football game. All right, Mel Farr, take a stab at this game. Yeah, you know, Kansas City hasn't really been playing that well as of late towards the end of the season offensively. They've um, uh, just, just looked a little bit out of sorts for whatever reason. Mahomes has been a little, you know, he's been a little erratic. He hasn't been the same Patrick Mahomes that he was last year. He's been a level below, you know, which you know, is still good because, you know, he played so outstanding last year. It might be impossible for him to repeat uh, the performance that he had last year, but they offensively, they haven't been playing as well. So it concerns me. They kind of been playing down to their competition as of late and then seemed like when they needed to turn it on, then they would go ahead and turn it on and, and, and just eke out with a win as opposed to just, you know, just going for the juggler, with a, you know, where they, they know they're so much more talented offensively than other teams that they just need to go for the juggler and hang a half a hundred on everybody because they're capable of doing that. So we'll see. You know, Cleveland is a good football team. They got some good players. They've got some good guys. You know, they play very good on the defense side of the ball that could cause some problems for uh, for uh, Kansas City. So we'll see. Um, I still expect Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes to come out with a win, but I do think it will be a good football game, probably a lot closer than a lot of people think. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, don't put it – Cleveland proved that they can throw, uh, move the football – they, their Mayfield's maturing more and more by the game, that's for sure. So, you know, I think it'll be an interesting football game, but ultimately Kansas City does move on to the next, to the next round. So, I don't know. I'm not going to put a point number on this. you got Baker Mayfield against Patrick Mahomes. It is a pretty interesting matchup at this time of the year, that's for sure. And two guys that are relatively young quarterbacks that are the future of the National Football League. One won a Super Bowl. You know, the Cleveland Browns are further ahead of the – uh, where they may be able to be, if they get to the Super Bowl in the next couple of years or so, there will only be three teams that have never been there. We don't really men- need to mention the other ones, but Cleveland's definitely on the right track. All right, the final game of the weekend, 640, Tampa Bay Buccaneers go to New Orleans. Uh, New Orleans Saints have had Tampa's number over there. They're 2-0 and against Tampa, and they've two and and they won them con- pretty convincingly. The last time they faced each other was in, November. Does anything change here, Melfar? You know, thanks to the Rams beating the Seahawks, this is this is what Tampa Bay gets. They get the opportunity to to face New Orleans at this in the divisional round. New Orleans, they're they're another team that's you know they they, they were kind of they kind of limped into the playoffs. They they played okay last week. Um, they didn't play great. They played okay in my opinion against Chicago. I think they gave. Chicago plenty of opportunities to hang to hang in that football game and even come out with a W. Um, New England, I mean, excuse me, the Tampa Bay, like we said, they've been kind of ascending as of late offensively, kind of getting their timing together, you know, getting the chemistry together. Um, it's just going to, you know, uh, Camaro is going to be difficult to deal with. 
uh, offensively. Um, I, I believe that Tampa Bay can win this. I think, um, you know, every time they played, I think the margin of victory has gotten smaller, I believe. I think they got blown out the first time. It was a little bit closer the second time. And I think that they, they you know, I think they, they, this is another team that is that, that, that kind of feels like they, it, it's their destiny, uh, especially with Tom Brady and him leaving uh, New, New England. I think him having a huge chip on his shoulder, a lot that he wants to prove. Uh, I believe that Tampa Bay will come out and, and win this game. I think they'll do every, you know, Tom Brady's going to do whatever it is that he has to do in order to make sure they come out, victor- come out of this game victorious. You know, Michael Thomas did get a touchdown in that last game at Chicago. So if New Orleans could get him playing at a high level, life could be difficult for Tampa. Then again, though, the other element that you have is Antonio Brown that's coming at the right time, even though some of the Buccaneers receivers and weapons are down. So, Rick, before I go into a prediction, you're going to talk about it. Go ahead. Yeah, this is going to be a great game. You got two Hall of Fame quarterbacks, you know, uh, no doubt Hall of Famers. Uh, you know, we'll see uh, what happens with Breeze. There's rumor that he might retire at the end of the season. We'll see what happens with that. It's going to be a great game. I do have Tampa Bay winning this game. I think they'll win by a field goal. It's going to be a close game. Um, I'm just not really sold on the on the Saints, to be quite honest with you. I think they're, they're overrated. And I don't know about if Breeze is still – I mean, he – He's come back from a lot of injuries, um, and, um, you know, he's been rusty, and he's 41 years old, and I think, I mean, and he's still a phenomenal quarterback. I just think Tom Brady has so much to prove. I think he's just delighted that the Patriots missed the Super Bowl. I think he's just so happy with that because now he's shown people that I was the one that made the Patriots successful. Not Belichick. It was me. If it wasn't for me, we wouldn't have won those Super Bowls. And he's proven it right now. His numbers are phenomenal. For someone who's 43 years old to throw, to have that much, like, was it 4,600 yards, 40 touchdowns at 43 years old is astonishing. He's like, I think he joined jo- uh, Blanda. I think he's the oldest quarterback now, I think, in the playoffs. So um, he's just amazing. I mean, he looks fantastic. He looks like he can play for another five years. So I like I like Tampa Bay in this. I just think they're the better team. And they're they're really red hot right now. They they're collect they're connected on all cylinders. Were in the early of the season, they looked disjointed. They they looked confused, um, and now they're really playing at a, a very high level and they're playing red hot. And like I said, I'm just not really sold on the on the Saints at, at all. To be quite, I think they're I think they're they're overrated. Yeah, I mean, New England didn't make the playoffs. Period. They didn't even get in the tournament. And I yeah. believe, like Mel said, Tampa is ascending at the right time. And New Orleans, I don't know, they'll go as far as, you know, their receivers will take them. But I think the biggest X factor in this football game is it's hard to beat a team three times in one year. Three. Yeah. You know, don't you think, Mel, you've done this, you've been in this game long enough that you've got enough game film after two games, you'd like to think you're going to learn a thing or two, right, Mel? You know, by the time you third time, as they say, should be the charm, right? And yeah. Tom Brady's on a mission. He's really, you know, Bill Belichick is looking – that Tom Brady, like Rick said, I told you so I could do it without you. And so far, you know, but this is a good football game. That's why he came into this division. So he can go ahead and line up against Drew Brees. Now, albeit Drew Brees is five and two against Tom Brady in games, but this could be five and three. I like Tampa Bay in this football game too. I really, really do. And I, but the real reason I like him is not only will Brady perform well in the clutch, Watch out for Antonio Brown. He's, they've, those two have connected for a few touchdowns the last couple of weeks. They really have. They're getting in sync. Remember, it was Brady that lobbied to get Brown there. I believe Brown is staying with Brady in the first place, and Antonio's having fun for a change. I don't think he can play for with another quarterback anyways. Of course, when you idolize Tom Brady, it's probably hard to do that. So I'm with you guys for sure on Tampa. Doesn't mean we make these predictions that we're right, but you know what? We're in a position where we can do them, right? So we'll see what happens. So, but meanwhile, I'm glad to, glad to have you guys back here, uh, and we're going to do it again next week, and uh, we're going to keep Mel busy uh, even during the off season as well. But any close, you know? So we have a lot of things going on uh, this week in football. We're obviously yeah, we're not here because of the holiday situation, so we're trying to get you caught up. We'll pare it down a little bit more with next week's predictions predictions as well as some major news developments which i'm sure we're going to get a lot of over the course of the next seven days 
So, uh, Mel, any closing thoughts about what you are looking for over the weekend? Look forward to some some good football. That's for certain. Right. You know, I've always you know, this is the best time of the year for football playoff football. There's nothing like it. So I'm looking forward to to, to seeing some some great games this weekend and see who comes out victorious. Um, you know, like like you know, it's it's going to be interesting. You got some new guys in there. Tampa Bay, obviously, being in there. You know having this opportunity because they got Tom Brady. It's going to be exciting. And of course, you know, what's going on up there with the, with the Bills, Bills Mafia, you know, you got to be excited for the people up there in, in the Eastern New York uh, or Western New York rather, and uh, for, the, for uh, with what's going on with, with Buffalo. So looking forward to all these games and see what happens. What are your thoughts, Mel, about the national championship game with Ohio State and Alabama. I know Alabama looked pretty good. Devontae Smith looks like he'd be a lock to go to Miami if they're smart uh, and to pair him up with Tua. I think Tua needs an impact weapon and Devontae Smith. And we're going to get into that another time. But I'm curious. We, we did have the national championship game between Ohio State getting it 7-0 and and Alabama played a lot more games. Any observations, Mel, about what Monday night was like? Yeah, yeah Alabama's a good football team. Nick Saban's a good coach. Um, year in and year out, they're going to be, you know, they're going to be there at the, at, at the Alabama Invitational at the end of the year. So it's just, you know, it's Alabama and, and who and everybody else. That's kind of how it looks. And it's probably going to be that way until Nick Saban, Nick Saban decides that he doesn't want to coach him. Um, yeah, the game kind of, you know, with all the weapons that they have on offense, and you just say, you just say, well, man, you know, the guy caught 12 balls for 215 yards in the first half. And, like, it wasn't like Ohio State didn't know he was the Heisman Trophy winner. It's not like they didn't know who he is or who he was. But they didn't do anything to try to stop him. I just don't understand what, you know, I guess you don't get the extra preparation like you normally do uh, playing a national championship game. But, you know, they've known all along who this guy is and what he's capable of doing. It's just unbelievable the guy can be running wide open the way that he runs wide open. But they have so many people that you have to deal with. You can't really double anybody because anybody can hurt you. You know, the running back can hurt you. You know, Max Jones played outstanding. You know, he had 444 yards or something like that passing. I think, you know, he hurt his leg and he stayed in there. He he played tremendously this year. Uh, what What Nick Saban is able to do year in and year out is truly remarkable. Uh, it just shows you the type of coach that he is. And the, the one thing that kind of stands out to me is he couldn't get it done at the professional level for whatever reason. Maybe he didn't give himself enough time to see if he could do it. I don't know. Maybe he could have went back and did it kind of like Pete Carroll. Pete Carroll didn't do very good when he was first there, went to college for a little while, won there, got his confidence back up again, went back to the NFL and, 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 and won, was very successful. Maybe Nick could do it at the at the NFL level. I mean, I believe that he could if he just if he really wanted to. And so that's the only thing that kind of scares me a little bit about Urban Meyer and, and the Jacksonville opportunities. You know, there's you know, there's I don't know if there's any better at the college level than Nick Saban. I don't think there is any anyone better. He's won seven national championships. All right. Well, Nick Saban was 15 and 17 with the Miami Dolphins. I just simply think that you want to go back to the college game when an opportunity like Alabama comes calling. That's the one job you don't turn down. You really don't, obviously. The tradition, the national championships, what you've got there. So Miami wasn't a bad job. What's that? No, it wasn't a bad oh, job, but bad uh, job. but the Alabama was a better job. And to be able to – and obviously it's pretty hard to second-guess what he's done because of the success that he's had. Rick, some observations about the uh, national championship game. Well, congrats to Nick Saban. You know, he passed Bear Bryant and most wins. To me, he's the greatest college coach ever. He's a, I mean, we're going to talk about him forever, forever, forever. He's one of the greats ever. Um, they were just explosive. I mean, I thought this was going to be a very close game, but Ohio State did a Clemson. was just like, wow. And um, I did have Alabama winning this game. I thought it'd be a close game. It was not close at all. And so they're just so explosive right now. Nick Saban's the greatest uh, college coach ever. And I think the reason why he did leave uh, Miami, I just think he didn't like the NFL. I think he saw that right. he's coaching a bunch of, bunch of millionaires, bunch of adult millionaires entitled. And then when he goes to college, you know, these kids are broke. They, they're trying to groom themselves. They're trying to grow. And I think he likes working with, with young kids where he can make them grow, where you're not going to make right. a, 
a 30 some year old guy who has a mansion and drives, you know, has 20 cars and he's famous and he, he doesn't look at Nick Sam like, I don't care who you are. You know, who, who, who do you think you are? I've been in the league for eight years. You're new here. I don't care what you did in college. So I think that's the reason why he left. And I just think he realized it's not, it's not great. I'm going to go back to college and that's where I had my, my success and the rest is history. Yeah, Rick, I think you nailed it all the way. The fact that he can develop young kids and uh, adults and then you come back and see what they've done. Mel, I mean, you ought to know this as well as anybody how, you know, with your uh, the work that you do with youngsters, that I'm sure you can appreciate what Nick Saban is trying to do to take young adults and turn them into adults and then being able to go back there and, you know, see them come back on campus and be proud of where they came from. Anytime you have a coach that could be a father figure to youngsters, that to me is a pretty good thing there. I mean, I don't, I've never met Nick Saban before. I know he's probably not the easiest to get along with. I'm sure he has a hard side, but I'm sure he's a soft side like we all do. So, but yeah. that said, uh, he's, paid, he's been paid equal to what professional uh, coaches get paid too. So, you know, why not? Yeah, I agree. But meanwhile, we had a great broadcast today. Next week, I expect us to do better. We're going to have more to work with. We had a lot to work with today. So, Every time we go out there, we do the best we can to make sure fans that you have everything you need. And we try to give it to you the best way we possibly can. With that said, Mel Farr, I want you to let everybody know what you're about and how they get a hold of you. Yeah, you can reach me on all the social media at, at Mel Farr Jr. That's Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. My email address is Mel Farr Jr., M-E-L-F-A-R-R-J-R at gmail.com. And you can kind of see what we have going on for the youth. In here, in, uh, here in Atlanta and also in Detroit at melfar.org. Now, we're not going to have the camp this year, um, obviously, because of COVID. But uh, So we're going to pause it this year, but we'll come back next year and we'll put on those camps for the kids. Very good. All right, Rick, we'll get a little announcement about Gastonia Baseball. Why don't you get, get that in before you get to your Charlotte stuff? Go ahead. I'm very curious about how this name turned out when you had different names before. So go out there and let it out there, Rick. Well, you know, uh, the... Uh... The uh, Gaston is getting a new professional baseball team. You know, they used to have the Grizzlies there. Uh, they're going to be in South Carolina now. So uh, the Atlantic League of Professional Baseball is looking to expand, and they reached out to Gastonia. Now they got a brand-new stadium there. They just announced their team name called the Gastonia Honey Hunters. Uh, pretty cool-looking logo. Um, I think it's going to be great for the city of Gastonia. You know, it's kind of a – you know, it has some um, – kind of some bad luck with their jobs leaving there. And I think bringing a professional baseball team uh, will really elevate it. They're already going to have restaurants and a, a brewery next door. So, and it's going to be a multi-purpose stadium where they're going to play like lacrosse and they're going to play other games as well. And um, some, probably some uh, soccer as well and uh, moving that at the park. So I'm looking forward to it. I'll be going to a game. The stadium looks great. I'm actually going to be going down there on Saturday to kind of check out the stadium and and everything. So I'm kind of excited. But, uh, yeah, I'm kind of excited to see uh, Gastoni getting this. And I'm just really – I'm really happy for the city because this is really going to be, you know, no pun intended, a home run. Okay, that's fine. All right, so once you let everybody know your contact information, I'll wrap it up. Then you'll do the uh, COVID message, Rick. Go ahead, continue on. Okay. Well, you can contact me on Facebook at Charlotte MLB. I am also have a page on there, Charlotte Bats Baseball. I'm also on Twitter at Charlotte Bats Baseball. I'm also on LinkedIn, uh, on Instagram at Charlotte Bats. And I'm also on LinkedIn under Rick Curti, C-U-R-T-I. And you can also check us out on our website at www.charlottebats.com. And our email address is cltbatsbaseball at gmail.com. Very good. All right, folks, you're, uh, you're listening and watching the Sports Exchange. My name is Scott Morgan of Motor City Mad Mouth. Pleased to be joined by Mel Farr Jr. and Rick Curdy. Uh, as far as our contact information is concerned, on Twitter, you can reach, uh, reach us at Tribune South with the at sign Tribune South. Uh, Facebook and Instagram, South Florida Tribune gets it done. We have a YouTube channel. Please subscribe to it. Uh, South Florida Tribune. Not, all it takes is a click, you're subscribed, and you get to see the uh, visual version of the broadcast. Our website's www.southfloridatribune.com. Rick Curdy does a wonderful job helping us promote on social media all the content that comes. We can never thank you enough, Rick. We have uh, information Thanks. for media uh, distribution partners, our columnists, as well as all the broadcasts can be found down there as well. You can email us at southfloridatribune at gmail.com. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, Scott Morgan Ross. 
And of course, if you want to hear the audio version of the broadcast, you can do so through Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast. So lots of different ways to hear us and watch us. And we have a lot of things that we're working on that I'll give you updates on over the next couple of weeks. But glad to have you both back on. Miss you guys quite a bit. But, you know, obviously right now the holidays, and I had a lot of other things I was dealing with. But we have a lot of work to do over the next few weeks, guys. So be ready to go. We have a lot of we have a lot of football to talk about, and when football's done, we probably have the colleges. So now, far you're not going away that t- anytime soon, my friend. So, Merrick, why don't you go ahead and give the COVID uh, nineteen message, please, before we wrap up the show? Well, guys, you know, right now, you know, things are uh, really uh, it's not it's not very good right now. Things are, deaths have gone up, hospitalizations have gone up. You know, I, I go on here all the time, and I just tell people. It's it's just important. Please wear a mask, social distance. Don't be stupid. Go, don't go to parties. Don't just avoid just being, you know, it's hard. I know it's hard being away from your loved ones and um, being around away from your friends. I miss it. I mean, it's just been, it's been bad, but you know, we have this pandemic going on. We haven't seen anything like this since 1918 with the Spanish flu. Just wear a mask, use some common sense, be safe. Because it's it's just not worth dying over. It really isn't. So we're gonna get through this. Vaccine shots are coming. We're getting a new uh, president. Hopefully, uh, things will uh, you know improve and uh, see what he does. And um, and um, it's just it's it's got, we're gonna get through this. You know, it's just right now we're just going through the hard part right now. But social distance, wear a mask, you know, wash your hands, and just please be safe. Well, you uh, tip my hand. The next time we see each other, we'll have a new president of the United States, Joe Biden, takes over. So uh, our, we can only send our best luck to Joe Biden. Hopefully he can help the country out a little bit. I'm not going to get into some of the other extracurricular activity that took place over the last week because it's really not worth my time of day. All I can say is good luck, uh, Joe Biden. We hope that you can certainly make a difference. But meanwhile, on behalf of my two partners, Mel Farr Jr. and Rick Curdy, my name is Scott Morgan, Rotham Motor City, Madmouth. Uh, welcoming, welcoming you guys to 2021, and thanks for joining us. And we, and as Tony Kornheiser and Mike Wilbon would say, I'm part of the interaction. We'll see what we can do better the next time. So, meanwhile, guys, have a great weekend, and we'll do it again next week. Good night, everybody, and and once again, enjoy the football.